What's up, everybody? It's Chris with Profoto, and this is Geared Up. This is our weekly live broadcast where we talk about lighting, gear, photography, anything that you want to talk about. We discuss that here right on this. If you're watching this on Profoto.com, you are going to see some kind of links pop up around the screens and stuff like that, uh, a product. So as uh, we are talking about things, uh, those products will pop up on the screen. You can click on that and get some more information about it if you would like. Uh, and the video will stay down low in the corner, so you are not going to lose us while that's happening. If you're watching this on Facebook or YouTube or Twitter or wherever you're watching this right now, you're not going to get that experience necessarily. Uh, but if you would like it, you can jump over to profoto.com and check that out. If not, hang with us here. We're going to be having a good time. That being said, today, uh, you uh, have a takeover. My ear AirPods are falling out of my ears. It's kind of not good. But Super excited to have a really, really awesome dude. Great photographer. Uh, you have definitely seen his work, and you definitely know him from the website F-Stoppers. He is one half of the founders of F-Stoppers, and that would be my dude, Patrick. What's up, my man? How's it going? Good. How are you? How's everything going? Good. Studio looks great. I just moved, moved back to Puerto Rico a month ago. We just bought this house been renovated and then now uh we've been working on getting the studio together so pretty busy i feel like i've been juggling like 10 different things so that's that's awesome good. man yeah and and moving is always a good time i know you and i spoke a little bit off camera about how awesome moving is but everything looks like it's coming along very very nicely yeah, we're super yeah. excited to have you here yeah <laughs> we're super excited to have you here at geared up um can you tell everybody you know if you want to tell everybody a little bit more about yourself and what we're gonna be talking about today yeah, so I've been doing, I don't know, photography for 15 years now. Started off as a wedding photographer, did that for a good 10 years. In the middle of that, started F-Stoppers, which was kind of a passion project. Quickly has turned into a huge you know, enterprise all in, a, in and of itself. And uh, Lee Morris and I just kind of hit the ground running and over the years have kind of transitioned out of wedding photography and then started shooting other types of photography and then started sharing all of the information that we had about photography. And uh, here we are today now living in Puerto Rico, pretty much doing photography full time through F-Stoppers, although we do have more and more projects coming up now that we're here in Puerto Rico. A lot of people, you know, want work done here. So, um, yeah, so I feel like we've, we, and we've had so many different studios. This video is kind of about using a small space. I am now in this tiny little garage, which is by far the smallest studio space we've ever had. Maybe when we first started F-Stoppers we worked out of Lee's little garage. So that was a tiny space, but in some ways I feel like we've kind of moved backwards and now uh, we're using something that more of your audience might be familiar with, a simple two car garage. Yeah, and I think, and, and your videos will probably discuss this too, but I think a lot of people don't understand the power of just have a, even a small space, you can do some pretty incredible work, so. You really can, it's just, you know, your imagination, your understanding of light, your control of light, um, I feel like in some ways, small studios are actually more difficult to work in, but um, in other ways, it's like, as you'll see in the video, you, you have the ability to light really simply because, you know, it is a smaller confined space. Definitely. So if, for anyone who doesn't know, um, there's not a live demo in today. What uh, Patrick has prepared for us are three separate videos kind of going through some different lighting techniques. Uh, we'll be here taking your questions uh, and then between uh, the three different videos, uh, we can answer your questions about anything that we're talking about. We also have uh, Patrick's uh, photos, uh, some BTS stuff and other photos that we will we'll be able to bring up on the screen so you can you can see all that stuff. So should we roll the first one? Let's jump right into it. Let's do it. Here we go. All right, geared up. This is a really cool opportunity. You are here in our brand new studio in Puerto Rico. If you followed our channel, you know that we had an incredible studio, but now we've built out two separate ones. This is our shooting studio, which is a two car garage. And so if you're at home thinking like, oh my gosh, all these photographers have these huge studios and there's no way I could ever rent one or buy one. I'm gonna show you what we've done with a two car garage. And so today we're gonna to be shooting some very simple test shots or some catalog images that you might be hired to take, say at a local boutique in your own town. We have Mia Blakeman. She's gonna be modeling for us. You can check out her Instagram below. And the first thing I wanna do is just show you how bad the natural ambient light is in a place like this. We're kind of in a cave. I do have some LED lights installed in the ceiling. 
but by no means are they ideal. So the first thing that I know from experience is I am going to have to let a lot of light into my camera. And in order to do that, I'm gonna set my aperture at 2.8. Take off my trigger. We're not gonna be using any strobes yet. I'm gonna go up to ISO, let's go up to ISO 400, and I'm gonna slow my shutter down to about 1 100th of a second. And for all of these shots, I want you to give me the exact same pose so that as we put them on the screen, we can compare all the different lighting that we're going to do. So I'm gonna step back as far as I possibly can. We have a white seamless here, and Mia is probably six feet off the back of it, which is gonna give some separation between our background and our model. Let's go ahead and take one shot here, three, two, one. And as you can see from this image, she's got the raccoon eyes, the white balance is kind of crazy. This looks as awful as you could possibly make it. So the easy solution for this is to add your own light. And the other thing I want to mention really quickly is that I'm shooting at 2.8 just so that I can get enough light into our scene. But these are definitely not the optimal settings for shooting catalog work. In many cases, you're going to want the entire outfit and the entire model nice and sharp. But then depending on how you use these images, you might send them off to a graphic designer or the company that you're shooting for. They may actually want to cut the model out and put them in different environments or different advertisement. So I'm going to now change the camera to the optimal settings for studio work, which is going to be about F8. I'm going to drop my ISO to about 200. That's reasonable. And then I'm gonna just increase my shutter speed a little bit to one over 200th of a second. The idea is to kill all the ambient light. I could cut these lights off, but then we wouldn't be able to see anything. But at these settings, if I just take a quick shot here, you can see the frame is 100% black. So I'm gonna add the Profoto Air Remote to the top of my camera. And these allow you to do some really fancy things like TTL. So you do need to buy the one that corresponds to your camera if you're going to use that function. Today, I'm just going to be using these all in manual. So I'm not going to use the TTL mode, but I can control all the lights that we're going to set up here. The first thing I want to do is probably not Profoto's biggest advertisement. I'm not going to use a modifier at all. I'm actually going to fire our little B10X here into the ceiling. This is a technique I use all the time as a wedding photographer or as an event photographer. If you have white ceilings and white walls, you can fire your strobe right into them and essentially create a huge light source. The one thing you're going to want to keep in mind with this is the closer that we set the light to the wall, the smaller the light is going to be. And if I bring this really far back, you could imagine almost like the sun outside, it's now going to light the entire wall and it's going to make a much larger light source. At this point, I would think that you might know the larger the light source, the softer the light. It's going to look almost like an overcast day. And the smaller the light source, the harder and harsher the light's going to look. It's going to look like you're at the beach and the sun's directly hitting you. So depending on the look that you want, you can manipulate the size of your light. And then the second thing you're going to want to really pay attention if you're bouncing your light is not just the size of the light, but also the position. If we get the light really far away, it's going to be even softer and it's going to light her and the backdrop evenly. If we get the light really close, it's going to just light our model and maybe the backdrop's going to go darker. So the first thing that I want to do, I'm just going to tilt our B10X straight up. And I don't want any of the light to spill over and hit our model because that's going to give us one an unflattering light but it's also going to give us this mixed light that's going to be really hard to understand what it's doing. And so to help you guys see what this effect is, we're going to turn the modeling light on. And as I lift this up, you can see if I get it really close to the ceiling, it's a tiny, tiny little light source. It's probably actually not going to do a whole lot to our scene. But if I lower it down, and if I lower it all the way, I'm now starting to light up a huge area. So this is really, really useful when bouncing light. I'm going to put it maybe two feet from the ceiling. The ceiling in here is only eight feet, so this is a pretty small studio space. And I'm just going to set this light right here. I'm going to go ahead and turn the modeling lamp off since I'm using battery. And let's go ahead and take a test shot. Again, we're at F8, 200th of a second, ISO 200. And you can see now, with the single strobe, we are able to get a frame. It's not black anymore. But if we zoom in, you can see it's casting all these shadows in her eye sockets, and it's making her kind of have those raccoon eyes, which we definitely don't want. 
And overall, it's just not a very flattering light position. So what I want to do instead, if you find that you're getting this sort of effect, is just to bring the light further back. And now I'm illuminating an area that's more in front of her, and it's going to start to open up the eyes. It might even, depending on how far back you put it, you might start to get the catch, eye, uh, catch lights in the eyes, which are really nice. Let's just go ahead and do a shot here. Go ahead and strike the same pose, Mia. Three, two, one. And now you can see this looks much better than where we started. Everything's really even. We have some soft light on the background. We don't have a lot of shadows being cast everywhere. But it's also, it's kind of bland. And so one thing that you can easily do is now move the light to manipulate the way the light is cast. Even though this is soft light, if we put it right over the camera, it's going to have all of our shadows being cast down, which sometimes looks nice. But if we move it over here to our side, we can now have soft light, but then give a little bit of directionality. And you got to remember, with directionality also comes texture. So now the clothing is going to show its shape a little bit better. You're going to have some highlights and some shadows. And so typically, the photography I like to do, I like to get the light as far off, or not as far off as you can, but definitely off to the side, maybe 45 degrees, 60 degrees, so that we get some highlights and shadows. Let's go ahead and take a shot here. And I'm going to go ahead and bump up the power just one stop because we've moved the light significantly further and kind of off to the side. We're now having to fire the strobe a little more to get the same exposure. And as you can see here, this is starting to look even better. Now we have a little bit of shadow under the chin. Her nose is casting the slightest shadow. Again, the shadows are really soft because we're using this bounce flash. And uh, you're not going to see them like you would like a hard direct sunlight. But it, again, it's giving a little bit more directionality. But while we're talking about bounce flash, one last thing I just want to show in this very, very simple setup that anybody can use is we don't just have to use the ceiling. I can also bring this light over. And because I have white walls, Lee and I actually just painted this studio yesterday. We had some ugly Caribbean island yellow, is what I call it. And uh, you definitely don't want colored walls because it's going to bounce off and then throw that cast onto your subject. So this really only works with white or potentially like a neutral gray. Um, we can fire the light into the side. And as you're going to predict, this is going to create a large light source that's coming from the hardest angle we've done yet. So this should have the most directionality. Three, two, one. And if we compare the two lights, this one feels a little bit more open. This almost has like a huge window light effect. If you look at her entire body, from head to toe, it just feels like she's being lit a little bit more evenly, where when we were bouncing off the ceiling, the upper part of her body was brighter, and then her legs started to get a little bit darker. So if you need to do full body, and you want to make sure the light's falling off evenly, you're going to want to use as large of a light source, and maybe even light shoulder or waist high, so that the light falling off is even. If you're more concerned about the face, or you're just doing three-quarter shots, you can get a little bit more directionality from above and uh, fire into the ceiling. All that being said, you probably don't want to light from below. That's just not very natural looking. You don't see that often when you go outside. But from the side or from the top are probably the most natural light sources. The final thing I want to do with Bounce Flash before we start getting into a different lighting setup is let's do the flattest light possible. And that is we have this white garage door. Let's just fire our strobe straight behind the camera. I'm not even going to angle it. I could point it in a different direction, but let's just fire it right behind me. And I'm going to go ahead and turn this up maybe a half a stop here. And now if I do the same shot, three, two, one. You can see we have very soft light. It's filling in her skin. This looks amazing for the model. But because there's no directionality at all, it's coming straight from the camera. It's almost filling in every single shadow on the outfit. So depending on you know, the purpose of these images, this shot is great for showing all the texture and showing the outfit in the most amount of detail. So in the next little segment, we're going to change everything up and use some hard light, do the complete opposite of what we've just done. And then maybe towards the end, we might play around with using some soft light and then some fill to kind of mix and match some lighting so that you have the yeah, most options, options available. available. That was awesome. There we, 
go. Chris, do you feel like um, people kind of talk down or look down on bounce flash? Do you use this a lot? I bounce, I bounce light all the time. Uh, I have white walls here in my studio. You can't see because I'm, I have a V-flat behind me. But my studio that I do the geared up stuff from, it, all the wild, walls are completely white. I bounce stuff all the time. So I, just, I have this feeling that people always want it to be way more complicated than it needs to be. Um, yes. And I feel like if they're not making it complicated, they don't consider themselves professional maybe. I'm not, I'm not really sure what the, what the critique of bounce light is. Yeah, I just feel like I, you know, lived and breathed that in wedding photography because you you have to light scenes, big scenes, quickly and easily, and you can't begin to set up, you know, scrims with double, you know, diffusion and all that stuff. So I feel like learning that early on in my career has now transitioned to where, like I said, I don't shoot weddings anymore, but I'm constantly shooting stuff in small spaces or on locations that I don't bring all the gear or whatever. And I feel like bounce flash is it's like that unsung hero of lighting that I honestly use Absolutely. a lot. And I think later in this video, I'm going to show you how I use it as fill, but I use it as fill all the time where maybe I have some really cool lighting setup, and then just a little bounce flash with a second or third strobe just kind of pulls all the shadows up. I think it's super, uh, super useful. Yeah. And I mean, even the image, the images that you created, they were all, I mean, I wouldn't say dynamic necessarily for the super flat light because there wasn't really much directionality to it, but you got two really killer looks. I mean, technically three really killer looks. So if, if the, the, I think that's the thing that people don't ask themselves enough of like, what is the purpose of what I'm photographing? They just start putting lights places in, and shooting them. So the flat light has its purpose. Um, but like, if you know, just between the bouncing it into the ceiling and back a little bit or into the wall, you got two really dynamic, um, lighting setups so it had a lot of directionality was super soft so again i'm not really sure what the critique on on bounce light is it's really really useful and it can be quite beautiful absolutely looks like we have a lot of questions here do you want to oh, throw yeah. some up or I yeah, can read well, as well yeah so let's let's start here so francis was wanting to know you know what's the best umbrella or softbox i don't are we going to be talking about any of that stuff in the next couple of videos should we save that I one i did or? not I did not use a soft box. Uh, well, I do have an Octabox. And I guess the, the short answer is, of course, every soft box does its own little thing. And, you know, depending on what you like to use, a lot of people might say, well, I didn't use a seven foot Octabox for fill. And the reason is, well, that's going to take up the entire space in here and it's going to be clunky and hard to use. But I've been hired to shoot this kind of work outside where you have to blast through 200 outfits outdoors. And for that purpose, yeah, I would set up a seven foot Octabox, put it up higher. You're outside, so you have plenty of space. You can pull it further away and you can get a similar soft light outdoors. I've definitely done that. Um, but then with weddings, I would love a two. I don't know if Profoto makes like a two foot by two foot small Octabox or a small soft box. Mm -hmm. I love that light because it's it's soft on people's faces, but it's still portable and it's kind of in between a soft and a hard light. Um, strip boxes yeah. are obviously good for the Martin Scholler look or for, you know, lighting the side of a model or product photography. So I don't think there's really a right answer. Um, I really do like, I don't know, does Profoto have an umbrella with the diffuser, kind of the Ann Leibovitz yeah, yeah. soft lighter kind of look? Yeah, yeah. That's so probably all, my we go-to a... umbrella. I really like having a diffuser over a bounced umbrella um, look. Mm -hmm. That's, that's yeah. my go-to umbrella. I love Octaboxes. Um, I, and I, I guess, uh, again, uh, I think Francis is who asked this question. So Francis, you have to ask yourself when you're, when you're shooting, like, what do you need to achieve? Like I love so uh, uh, soft boxes and I love umbrellas, but if I'm on the go and I need to be pretty quick about what I'm doing, an umbrella is going to be, you know, primo for that because setup and breakdown, super simple. Like Patrick was saying, you could add a diffuser to it. So if you wanted to feel a little bit more like a soft box, you could do that. And the cool thing with an umbrella into a diffuser is it's indirect. So you don't have to worry about any hot spots. Um, it, the downside is they're a touch flimsier. You know, if you don't weigh down your light stand and it takes a, a, a spill, it's pretty easy to lose an umbrella. I've lost many. Uh, soft box is gonna be a little more robust, but in that robustness, you're gonna have setup and breakdown time. So you just have to ask yourself, what is it that you want? Let's see. Um, 
Jay Walker says he's learning how to uh, do lighting in a small space right now. It's all he has to work with. One light setups and learning as he's going. That's sweet. Awesome. Uh, working at a living room home studio. This is from Jennings Ford. Uh, and enjoying the freedom of, freedom of being in a no pressure freelance photographer. Uh, appreciate the helpful video. So uh, Jennings Ford is telling you thank you, Patrick. You're welcome. Um, there's another Facebook user, no name. We're going ambiguous, but it says on that scenario, why didn't you just add more lights? It would be easier. Uh, your light into the ceiling, then one more for the face and a background light. I think he was asking that when I showed the overhead LED lights that we had. Mm -hmm. um, you could definitely mix LEDs, and LEDs are great because these lights actually, um, they run on an app, so I can change the color, they're RGBW, so I can do all white balance colors plus crazy party colors. Um, they're not very powerful, so when you start shooting at F8, you have to either bump your ISO up or drag your shutter, which can introduce some interesting problems and, and effects, um, but... I think the, my goal for this shot was to make it very simple. As I've gotten older and more seasoned in my field of photography, I used to light, like to light everything, rim lights and hair lights and make it super edgy. And if I really could do any type of genre, it'd probably be like athletic portraiture where you have all those crazy outlines and everything super dramatic. I love that kind of stuff. But when you're shooting for catalog or test shoots for the model, say you have an agency and they send you girls and you just want to test shot and do like very simple stuff or e-commerce, that's kind of another angle of this video. You need to shoot stuff to be sold on Amazon or on Etsy or on, you know, any, any number of platforms. This simple lighting is actually, I think, preferred. When you start making these super edgy, you know, five light setups, Sometimes it looks dated. Sometimes it looks like Olin Mills or Glamour Shots. You remember those in the 90s? Oh, yeah. Um, or it just starts to look, in my opinion, kind of like more masculine, more edgy. And a lot of consumers don't necessarily gravitate to that. It's kind of like buying Coca-Cola or Diet Coke versus Coke Zero. Coke Zero has a very different branding than Diet Coke, even though they're very, very, very similar. Um, so... Long story short, you could add all these different lights and incorporate the natural light that you have and add a kicker and a hair light. We've done tons of stuff like that on our F-Stoppers channel, but I always love to make it simple if I can. Somebody mentioned Albert Watson, a good friend of ours, uh, Monty Isom. He used to assist Albert Watson, and he was like, that guy can take one single light, and he can get 50 different looks. He's kind of the master of the one light setup, and I think... As photographers, it's very easy to go down this road of because I have a bunch of lights, I need to use them all and, you know, put a fill here and a kicker here and an edge light here. Don't underestimate the simplicity of just using one light. In many cases, your clients, if you look on Instagram, they actually prefer something simple that looks natural. 100%. Um, also, thanks for the uh, the Coke, going the Coke direction, not the other one as, as an Atlanta. And I, I really appreciate that. Um, talking about everything. How dare you, sir? How dare okay, you? You're from Atlanta. Yeah, I get it. I get it. <laughs> um, Angelica was asking on Profoto.com, what si what's the size of your garage? You you mentioned you have eight foot ceilings, but what's the the floor? yeah? So this is uh, we have eight foot ceilings, but I think this wall here. I've measured this so many times, I've already forgotten it. This feels about twenty feet. And then this is probably 20 feet as well. There's a weird cove here with a closet. So, you know, 20 by 20, it's literally a two-car garage with very little space on the side. So um, I know a lot of people have garages, and they can't afford to keep their cars parked in front or somewhere else. But if you have a space that you can clear out like this, this is the perfect room that's already there. And in many cases, if you just weatherproof it and seal the, the door, I can't easily lift my garage up anymore. But... Um, it's a good place to at least have a part-time studio. Yeah, I uh, I hung a uh, like a makeshift um, ceiling grid right in the way of my garage door, so I can only lift my garage door up halfway to like slide things in and out. So you just have to figure out what you're willing to give up, right? Yeah, and that's what I'm doing now is I'm trying to figure out where I can mount uh, moving blankets, sound blankets to help with the reverb, and also smaller uh, backdrops that aren't going to block the tracks because in an ideal world, especially here with hurricane season 
Um, there probably are times where I need to open the garage and like move stuff in or reinforce things or I, I want that flexibility, but it's definitely difficult trying to yeah. figure out exactly how to uh, engineer everything to work without, you know, removing the garage door. Okay. It's uh, just a couple more questions and we're going to jump back into the second video. Someone was asking for catalog work. Do you have a lens preference? Um, I typically have always preferred shooting longer. The 70 to 200 is my favorite lens of all time. In this space, I've, I've found out that if I stand where I am now and shoot diagonally, I can gain some extra length and probably shoot beyond 70. Maybe I can get 85 millimeters. It also depends on the height of the model and how far off the backdrop they are. Um, so 70 is kind of my limit in this space. Um, that being said, I think 70 to 100 is the perfect sweet spot for um, seamless. You don't really need to blur or compress the scene too much in the studio. When I shoot catalog work outside and I can use the seven foot octobox, I will love to get 100 millimeters. Uh, 200 might be a little too much, but it's nice to get further away and make your scene really blurry and to be very particular. I, I had to shoot uh, hundreds of outfits for a company that did kind of like horseback riding, like very Southern, it was a very Southern company. So the boots and the vests and everything kind of had that equestrian feel. And where we were shooting, the backdrops had some amazing things there, but you also had a lot of ugly things. So shooting longer allows you to control exactly the sliver of background that's behind your subject. So I like that a lot too, but I think anything over about 55, 60 can work. It just depends on, you know, the environment that you're in. Yeah, I guess you just want to make sure you're not distorting anything, especially if it's for a specific product. You you want it to look the most, the closest to what it actually looks like when the person gets it. Yep. Yeah. Someone was asking, uh, what would be the difference between bouncing into a high ceiling versus bouncing into a shallow ceiling or a short, so, a, a lower ceiling? As you saw in this video, the lower the ceiling, the easier it's going to be to cast the light from above and get all of those shadows to come down into the eye sockets and be unflattering. If you have a tall, tall ceiling, you can sometimes fire straight up. And because it's so far away, the light spreads out and it looks more like an overcast day. The disadvantage of a tall ceiling is you are going to have to fire your strobes much more powerful. You're going to set them to full power or you need to put them on stands and raise them really high up. Sometimes, you know, 10, 15, 20 feet just so that you're not losing all of that power going all the way to the ceiling and then all the way back. Um, if you, with cameras these days, I mean, you can set your ISO to ISO 1600, 3200. And if the light is clean and nice, 3200 is not really going to look as grainy as it did 10 years ago. So yeah. I think the advantage of a small space is that you can keep the light pretty close to your subject, which is more, um, efficient for your strobes, but you have to be a little more particular. You can't have the light too close or it's going to cast too far down. And if you go too far away, you know, if, if the ceiling is really low and you're lighting 10 feet away, you'd have to imagine, you know, if I put a strobe back here, firing into the ceiling, it might be so far and the ceiling so low that it might not even affect me at all. Whereas a big mm -hmm. space, you can kind of just fire a strobe or two into the ceiling and no matter where you point it, the space is so big, you're going to be creating soft light everywhere. Um, so I don't know. You just kind of have to play around with those spaces. and be. I, I've shot so many weddings that I know this so well. But if you're in a small, small space, you have to be a little bit more particular, but you can lower the power. Mm -hmm. If you're in a huge space, you probably have to bump your power up a lot. But you can get natural light very easily because your light source is becoming huge. Very, very cool. Let's jump into the second video. How about it? Yep. Let's do it. All right, so we just did a few different bounce light techniques to get really soft light, and that's just using one Profoto B10X. Now we're gonna use one of their reflector dishes. This is probably their most popular modifier because you can also put grids in it. And for this purpose, I'm just gonna put this on our strobe so that it kind of contains the light. I don't want the flash firing into our video cameras. I don't want it flaring into my camera. And then also because we're in this really small space, Sometimes just firing these things off with no reflector at all just kind of sends light everywhere. So the goal for this is we want to create a look that almost looks like she's being lit
by direct sunlight. If you've ever seen these images where the model is on a pure white background or maybe even a textured background and it just has tons of contrast, lots of hard shadows, lots of highlights, it looks like they're in a parking lot being lit by the sun and they did their shoot outside. Most of the time, they're just using really hard light. So the trick to this is we want to get our light really high. We don't want to go so high that you start to get those raccoon shadows and the sun's, you know, like uh, three in the afternoon. You kind of want that late sunlight or early sunlight. So we don't want to go too high. And in this studio, I actually can't go too high. I could probably put this all the way to the ceiling and it's still not going to be a bad position. But then we also want to light our model and our background kind of evenly. If you imagine the sunlight, the sun is so far away that even when it lights you, it's lighting the background, even if it's 100 feet away, it's lighting it from the same ratio just because the sun is so far away. If I get this light too close to our model, she's going to be hit with hard light, but then we're going to have some really strange stuff going on in our background. So not only do we want the light high, but we also want to pull the light back really far from our subject. And in this studio, if I back this all the way up to our garage door here, maybe this is like 15 feet away. Let's go ahead and take a shot here. And from experience, I know I'm going to have to lower the power too because we're not bouncing the light and it's coming straight off of the front of the Profoto head. I'm going to take this down. Let's do three stops and just kind of see where we're at. Go ahead and strike the same pose for me. And as you can see from this shot, we now have a really hard shadow being cast behind her. And because we're using seamless paper, you can see the bend in her shadow. And if we zoom in on her face, you can see a little bit of shadow under her chin, but the nose shadow, that's usually what I look at when I'm trying to diagnose how somebody lit a shot. The shadow is really close to the bottom of her nose. It's not coming down and eating into her lip, which is typically something you want to avoid. It's just the faintest, sharpest little shadow. And that tells me right there that the light is pretty close to being over the camera. Let's go ahead, just for fun, I'm going to move this light over. We're going to take a few different shots. And I'm just going to show you how moving the light off to the side really affects not only the shadow, but also the highlights and the shadows on our model and on the clothing. I mean, if you're shooting catalog work, most of this stuff is kind of about the clothing. You want to show the most amount of detail possible. And now you can see we have the shadow kind of creeping further off to the right. And if we zoom in on her face, that shadow from her nose is starting to get longer. It's, it's definitely off to the side. It looks very natural, um, but let's keep going. I, I really like that image. I think that looks better than the light being kind of directly over the camera. And now I would say maybe we're at like 45 degrees off. I'm never too scientific where I place my light, but so in my opinion, this is now starting to look like that classic single hard light look where the shadow on her nose is really being cast off to the side. It's a, it's a pretty flattering angle too. It's not like eating into her lip or going into her cheek or anything. Some people might call this kind of that Rembrandt lighting, but with a hard light. And as you can tell from the clothing, we now have some harder shade on the model's left side, our right side, and we have more highlight on the side closest to the strobe. So this shows off the clothing really, really well. And that's kind of our goal with this is to make sure you know what the light might look like and you know, the texture and the sleeves and all the little details on the outfit. So that's really nice. Now, as we look at these images, I just want you to keep in mind that our shadows are kind of light and filled in. They're not super, super dark and contrasty. And I think the reason for that is just we have so much fill in this room because our ceiling's low, everything's painted white, and as our strobe is firing, it's bouncing off everything and just kind of filling it in. If you were outside at night or in a huge studio space, or maybe your walls weren't white at all, then you're going to get much darker shadows. So just keep that in mind. Of course, if you want lighter shadows, just bounce a light in the room and you're going to get that fill effect that we're getting here. So up until now, this has been pretty straightforward. We've just done some bounce light and we've done some hard light, but these are the two lighting scenarios that every photographer needs to master. And to be honest, this is just like the go-to lighting that I would use shooting something like this. In the next little segment, I'm going to try to mix some directional light with some fill and use a two light setup if you want to just get something a little bit more polished 
so that perhaps you could just dump all the images straight off your camera, give them to your client. They would have to do very little tweaking and it just looks a little bit more professional, but I would say 90% of the time, these are the lighting setups that I use day in and day out. That was pretty dynamite. I, I am such a sucker for hard light and uh, it, I, lo I just love the look of one, like zoom reflector, white background, it's super clean. I used to be so scared of hard light. Um, I mentioned, I think in the video that it's like harsh light and somebody was saying like, why do you call it harsh? I think hard light is, is maybe the best way to say it is it's, it's less forgiving. If you put the light in the wrong place, you have to shoot a person at noon. Everyone says, you go to the forums and I remember always, everyone would say like, you can't take somebody out at the middle of the day, it's the worst light. And then you work with fashion photographers or swimwear photographers or you know people who wedding photographers who have to shoot in the middle of the day, and they they make it work. You know it's all about position and making sure that that hard, harsh light is flattering. Um, you know hard light looks great, but for so many years I was so scared of it because I would go out and I wouldn't be very particular and I would, you know, not look at someone's face and instead look at the scene and say, this is going to look awesome. And then I get back and say, man, these pictures look really bad. Um, I think I strayed away from hard, a single hard light source for a long time. And part of it was because it's so easy. I thought by adding the big soft box and everything, like I was being more professional and like, that's the more flattering light. And then as you, you know, become a little more seasoned and you start looking at, you know, a lot of the photographers in the past, it's like, man, hard light is pretty, pretty awesome. It's, it's really beautiful. I think the one thing that I tell people, I think the one thing that people do wrong with hard light is they pay attention to where the light is. Where I always tell people when you're starting with hard light, pay attention to where the shadows are, work on controlling the shadows. Don't worry about, worry about controlling the light and that'll kind of get rid of that harshness. I think just harshness for the most part, people just consider just unflattering. Um, but if you just pay attention more to the shadows than necessarily where the lights to obviously you have to pay attention where the light is, but it's more about controlling the shadows than it is about um, anything else. So that's, that's kind of, at least for me, what made me start loving hard light a little bit more. Another little tip that I didn't really mention in the video that I think is important, you're talking about the, the highlights and paying attention to the shadows, is because hard light is so unforgiving, in many cases, you might want to figure out the pose or the direction of the model first, and then add the light to the scene. Because with soft light, it's super forgiving. In many cases, especially if you're using two, two soft lights on either side or bouncing a light, the model can kind of move wherever she wants and the light's always going to look good. But in all the examples that you saw, especially some of the, uh, I had the model pose exactly the same for this video so that we can see exactly what the light's doing. But then after I got done filming, we did a little photo session where I got images that actually would look like the commercial shots that, you know, you would release to the web. Um, mm -hmm. She's always kind of moving towards the light and favoring that side where this shot that you see right now wouldn't work if she moved in the opposite direction. So mm -hmm. if the model has a side that looks better, or say she's wearing clothes that are asymmetrical, you might want to shoot both just so that you have them. But this light really wouldn't work if she turned to her left, because now her face is going to be in shade. And you know it, it could work depending on what the purpose of the image is. But if you want the most flattering light on the model and the clothes, you have to almost say, hey, you're going to favor this side and then put your hard light up. Whereas soft light, you can kind of just put that wherever and she probably could move a lot more. Definitely. So uh, let's see if we have any other questions really fast and we'll jump into the third video. Let's see. People are just saying stuff. Awesome. Very interesting. Uh, love the pro Profoto Fresnel and the Magnum Reflector. Those things are pretty dynamite. I'm trying to see if there's anything over here on Profoto.com. Uh, looks like Anders is getting a lot of stuff answered over there. So uh, let's uh, I'm gonna jump into the third video. Let's do it. Let's do it, man. So at the beginning of this little lesson, we used soft light by bouncing it off the ceiling and off the walls. And then we transitioned to using really hard light where we positioned our strobe high up into the ceiling and fired contrasty light on our subject. But now I wanna do something that's kind of in between. I wanna use a smaller light source than just bouncing it into the ceiling but I don't want it quite as hard as the reflector dish. 
And that's where something like these OCF softboxes, this is a three foot octa, come in handy. I really love this one because it's not so big that it's replicating you know, the bounce light technique, but it's larger than the small head of a reflector dish. So somewhere the five foot's cool, the three foot's really nice. So let's go ahead and mount this to our strobe here. Fits on just like that. And then I wanna position this, let's put this over on this side of our model where we don't even have a wall to bounce off of. I'm gonna angle this down a little bit. That's gonna reduce some of the spill onto the ceiling. And then the general rule is just kind of somewhere in the 45 degree angle position and then just facing down but slightly above her head. And now that we're using a softbox and we're not firing directly at our model, we need to go up in power. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn this up. Let's start with two stops. Three, two, one. And now you can see we have a light source that is very similar to the bounce light, but it's exactly in the position that I wanted. If I feel like the shadows on her nose are off just a bit, I could come just a little bit more around. And you can see there, now we're controlling the spill on our background a little bit better. So we're actually getting a background that's more gray, which is really good for shooting catalog work. It makes the colors pop off a little bit more. But we're still getting that nice soft directional light. It's not as large, so it's not lighting up her whole body quite as much. But this looks really, really nice. Now, the next little thing that I think could be useful is what if we combine this semi-hard Octobox look that's coming from camera left and add a huge fill to it to open up the shadows a little bit more and maybe even control the density of our background. In order to do that, I'm gonna grab a second strobe. Right here I have another pro photo. This is one of our B10s, which is just basically the older version of the B10X. I think the modeling lamp and the new one's a little bit brighter. But in terms of power, um, they're about the same. The recycle rate might be a little bit slower on the older model, but. So our key light is set at 6.5. Because we're bouncing off this huge wall, I'm gonna set our fill to seven. So it's just a little bit more powerful. I'm not a very technical photographer, so I don't go around with a light meter and check everything. But if we just do a couple test shots, you can figure out if you like the effect. So as you can see from this photo, we now have nice, soft, directional light from our Octobox that's creating some shadows, but then we're filling in the entire scene by bouncing another strobe off the back wall and it's acting as a huge, soft fill. You could really dial this to taste. If we turn this down much more than that, it's really probably not gonna have much of an effect in this scenario. And if we turn it up even more, it's gonna become so overpowering that at some point it's gonna look like the really flat light behind the camera and our Octobox is really not gonna have much of an effect. So there you go, three different lighting setups using bounce flash, direct hard light, or using a softbox and mixing a little bit of fill in there. I think these are super useful. Every photographer should basically be learning to master this because like I said, you shoot in catalog work, this is something you use every single day. I just want to thank the guys over at Profoto and Chris Fain for allowing me to come on the show. This is really cool to be able to share this with you guys. If you want to check out our channel, it's fstoppers.com or fstoppers on YouTube. We create content like this all the time. We also work with other photographers. If you do want to check out some of our paid content, uh, things that are very different than fashion or catalog work, you can head over to fstoppers.com slash store where we have tutorials about landscape photography, headshots, portraits, all kinds of stuff. So again, thank you guys for allowing me to come and show you our brand new studio. And hopefully over the weeks, we're gonna have even cooler stuff coming out of here. I'm really excited to finally have our own space and to be back in Puerto Rico. That was awesome. So uh, this isn't a question that anyone would ask, but it's something that maybe people who are thinking about getting into catalog work or figuring out which one of these looks is the best, like how, how is the look of a catalog shoot decided? Is that like an art director thing? Is that, you know, the, the brand wants that? Or is that just a creative decision that you get to make? It depends. Like if I'm doing it for my own personal, you know, shoot, then I can decide whatever I want, you know. Um, usually when I get hired to do something, like I, I recently had, it was, it was right before I moved to Puerto Rico, so it was a couple years ago, but I had a big catalog shoot where, they needed images for Black Friday. And they contacted me November 5th 
and they said, we just paid thousands of dollars to have a photographer shoot all this stuff, and it looks bad. It's not usable. We can't put this on our website. And so I had to plan and get everything from, you know, the 5th to whenever Black Friday is. It was like the 23rd-ish. Um, like, I had to have it done before then so they could prep it and get it on their website. So it was like a two-week window to shoot hundreds and hundreds of outfits. It was so much work. And in that case, like... I can guide the client and say, like, let me, well, in that case, I could say, let me see what they submitted so I don't replicate that. And uh, I could kind of give them guidance on, okay, you want it to look like your website, or I think you want it to look this way. This is a competing brand that you're, uh, you're up against. Here's what they're doing. You can kind of massage it and, and push them in a different direction or kind of, you know, figure out exactly the look that they want. Um, most of the time, if it's a paid shoot, it's a conversation that you're going to have with the director, or in this case, it was the owner of the company. Like it was a very small company, so I was dealing directly with, uh, you know, the top few people in that brand. So, I think you just want open conversations. And again, you can go crazy and create all these really edgy looks, but if that doesn't fit their style, then you know that's probably not the direction you want to go. And then also with catalog work, there's also, in my my limited experience, I don't shoot this all the time, but. There's kind of the hero shots where if you go to Gap or H&M.com, there's going to be those pictures that just pop up instantly. And they're usually in a scene. They're on location. They look really stylized and cool. Those might have a different direction than when you click men's clothing or women's clothing and you have a scrolling you know, link where you're just seeing all these images. In many cases, those are all going to be identical. Although I recently went to, I think, H&M.com, and I was shocked to see they were mixing and matching. I mean, they would have gelled lights, which I'd never really think of using for catalog work, where the background has all these crazy colors. And then they would have kind of the boring bounce light white. And it would be mixed in there to where, you know, I think their advertising is a lot different than where it might have been, you know, 5, 10, 20 years ago, where everything is very consistent. So definitely have those conversations. The last thing that you want to do is come up in your mind with what you want to do as a photographer and then go down that path. And then all of a sudden it's not what the client wants or needs, or there's some weird shadow that they don't like. I would always shoot tethered or at least at a workstation where you can pull up the images as you're taking them. And everyone confirms that this is the look we're going for throughout the whole day, or at least for this small little session, you know, and then maybe you change it up. Cool. I think we have a couple more questions and I think we'll call it a day. Um, Jennings Ford was wondering, uh, have you ever used a dark background when shooting clothing? Uh, that's, uh, that is where we have to start adding separation uh, lights on the model to be sure to keep the structure and the clothing material. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I've shot on dark backgrounds. I find that most companies desire that a little bit less than white or bright airy backgrounds. Um, and, and I find the easiest thing to do is actually to shoot on more of a middle gray background. You can go on YouTube and find all these tutorials on how to change the color of your background using a color layer mask. And I find that that's probably like, I don't do that a lot, but if I'm sending these images off and I know that their retoucher, their graphic designer is going to play around with it a little bit more, I think maybe shooting on a, a light gray is probably the most uh, versatile. But if you're shooting for an edgier brand, sometimes you're scrolling through Facebook and you see, you know, those, at least I see, like the, the men's outdoor coats and they're all super edgy and cool and they got all the patterns. Um, a lot of those, they will shoot on a darker gray, a thunder gray, and then cut out the model using light. So again, I think it's just a preference thing. It's a branding thing. You need to talk to the creative director or, you know, the advertising agency, whoever you're working with and figure out what the look is that they want. But if you don't do any of this and you want to get more into it, I think set up a couple free sessions with some attractive models, guys and girls, get some cool clothing and do all of it. You know, do the bounce light, do the hard light, do some. Uh, one thing that's really popular is to have the background the same color or tonality as the clothing. So if you're shooting a pea coat that's green, you could either get a green roll of paper to kind of match that or use the Photoshop technique where you can dial it in perfectly. And, you know, have that on your website to where if somebody is looking to have that kind of work in their market, you already have built the portfolio so that you get the work, you know. And then from there, you can send your clients to your website and say, what exactly is it that you want to do? And instead of referencing, 
you know, H&M.com, you're sending people to your website and showing them what you're capable of doing. And they have maybe four or five different choices and then they narrow it down from there. That's, that's awesome. Uh, Carl was wondering, could you get the, uh, could you use a five foot Octa to replicate the same like wall bounce look? Absolutely. I mean, that is probably what most people would do. It's just, as you saw, building a five foot Octa, I mean, how deep is the pro photo? I mean, you're going to add like at least probably 18 to 24 inches in depth that you're going to lose. And by the time you put it on a light stand, um, you know, it's just, it's clunkier. It's producing the same sort of light. But if you had a huge space, that would probably be my go-to, a five or seven foot octabox. But when you're in a small space, just being able to put like a tiny light stand with a head that's firing directly in the back, it's, it's a little bit easier to manage in a space like this. Someone else was asking, um, with your octabox, were you shooting it aimed at the subject's face or down a little bit, like pointing more towards the floor? Um, what was this for? This was for fill or for uh, key light? This was uh, the main light. Sorry. It was the, the, when you were using the three foot Octa, was it, was the yep. three foot Octa pointed at the model's face or down a little bit? I have it pointed down a little bit. I don't know technically if it makes that big of a difference, but again, in a space like this, if I don't tilt it down, I'm going to start getting bleed and I'm going to get fill from the light coming off the top of the Octa box into the ceiling and coming down. In some cases, that might be cool because you're adding a little bit of soft fill around the side of their hair, and it might act as a hair light. That might look really nice. I just find the little bit of shooting that I've done in the studio so far, tilting the light down, it allows me to feather the light so that it's not hitting the ceiling and spilling all over the place. Um, another thing that I didn't do in this video that would be really helpful is you can buy the grids for all these light modifiers. And in small spaces like this, I find the grids are more useful than big spaces because you're really trying to take the soft light, but instead of firing it everywhere, you want the soft light to come straight at whatever you're mm -hmm. aiming it to. Um, the little fabric grids, I mean, those are super useful, and I think a lot of photographers ignore that. I'd always yeah. have grids on. I had grids permanently on all my soft boxes when I was in smaller spaces early in my career. Yeah. I think the feathering technique thing sounded cool too. I was on a shoot with Michael Anthony once and he was actually feathering the edge, the, the bottom edge of a zoom reflector. And I'd never seen that done before. I thought that was kind of awesome. So another thing um, you can do, I mean, that's no. a whole other video. Yeah. But you can take gaffer's tape and start like taping up the side oh, yeah. of the reflector and it's not going to produce a hard edge like you might imagine, but it is kind of creating a soft feathered light where if you really want to be particular about, using a hard light, but not having it fall off onto your background or something. I do that all the time where I just actually tape to the reflector dish or put a like foam core and tape that to it. There's a lot. That's pretty cool do. technique. Yeah. When you want to really control the light. That's pretty awesome. And then, um, someone was asking, you know, what do you think about shooting like Zara? A lot of the, they use a lot of lookbook photos more like art analog photo shoots. So, and I think I've actually been seeing a lot more companies do like that live, their, their photos are more lifestyle oriented than necessarily on a seamless. Yeah, I, I don't know if I know what Zara's images look like particularly, but I can imagine kind of what they're talking about. And I've noticed that a lot with, uh, with Instagram, just how <laughs> there's actually a video I would like to do where it's like, model takes her own Instagram photo versus professional photographer. And in some mm -hmm. ways, kind of like we said at the beginning of this video, I think we overthink things too much and we try to light everything and get it perfect and edgy. And like, we want it to look appealing to a photographer or we want to challenge ourselves as photographers and do something that we haven't done or something. There's a saying that we always have where just because it's harder and more difficult to accomplish, doesn't necessarily mean that it's intrinsically better. And so a lot of times Instagram models or, you know, these vintage looks, they're just going out and just snapping away. And it looks almost like too easy, but that mm -hmm. style is really popular. This deconstructed look, the unretouched look, um, there's the unretouched, retouched look where it's still retouched, <laughs> but it's retouched in a way not to look retouched. <laughs> All of that is super, super popular. And it's kind of become the flavor the last, you know, five years or so. I love that stuff. If you can go out with no lighting and just snap away, even, you know, I don't shoot film, but you give it that look. Um, that's like the easiest thing you can do. But you have to be comfortable and confident that you can pull it off. 
and then it's kind of a marketing thing. If you market that as your style, go crazy with it. But you know, when you're shooting, like I said, hundreds of outfits in a day to put on their website, sometimes like you just can't afford to do that. You need something consistent, quick, and you just have you know two or three people coming in and out, changing places, and you're going one, two, three, turn, one, two, three, turn, one, two, three, turn, next model, next outfit. I mean, you shoot 200 outfits in a day. I mean, you have to have a rhythm and you don't have time to be you know, scouting around and checking things out. You just need to knock it out. So I think there's a place for both. And uh, you just have, again, being brand sensitive of what it is that they want to accomplish is so important. This was super fun, man. I really, really appreciate you doing this. Tell people again how they can, they can find you. Yeah, so we are on all the social media platforms. You can go to official F-Stoppers. You can go to fstoppers.com. I started, off, uh, started up a F-Stoppers PR, which is kind of just what we're doing here in Puerto Rico. Um, obviously, fstoppers.com. We sell tutorials from you know, really well-known photographers on all different types of genre um, at fstoppers.com slash store. Recently, we did one called The Well-Rounded Photographer, which features eight different photographers, eight different genres, and the idea is that you probably want to specialize at some point in your career, but figuring out what that specialty is or just learning more to apply to the specialty that maybe you're doing, you can learn from all these different genres. Like, I don't know anything about macro photography. And it was so interesting to see the techniques that a macro photographer uses. And maybe you now apply that to jewelry or maybe you apply that to some kind of interesting portrait that you're doing. Um, you can check out the well-rounded photographer and kind of get a taste of a little bit of everything. And then that might open your eyes up to different lighting that you can do for your genre. Or, you know, you might say, hey, I really love headshots, but I never even knew that headshot you know, photography was a business. And now through, I think, friends like Peter Hurley, I mean, everybody, in my opinion, should be shooting headshots to some degree. Maybe it's just one day a week, but it's an easy way to supplement your income, especially, you know, with COVID being behind us and now it's trying to figure out how you can make more money with, you know, the crazy environment that we're in today. Um, mm -hmm. Definitely check that one out. I think that's probably one of the most unique tutorials we've ever made. Cool, man. I really appreciate it. Thank, thank you again so much. Um, and we'll have to do this again soon. This is really fun. Yeah, this was great. It, you know, pushed me to actually get something done in this studio. So I appreciate it. <laughs> the garage that. is clean. So, so we're good to go. All right. Well, I appreciate it, man. Thank you so much. I got a quick question for you. Can oh, people, yeah. once this is wrapped up, is there, are all the questions locked into this or can people still interact with this video on your website? Yeah. So if you're watching it on profoto.com, I believe the, the question portion there, it's a wrap. Like you can't ask anymore, but these will still live on YouTube and Facebook and okay. people can go in there and they can add another comment and uh, we can reply to it there. So if, if anyone's watching this, uh, keep, keep engaging and, and, and we'll be more than happy to answer any questions that you have. Awesome. Well, thank you guys for having me and uh, it's an awesome show. It's really cool. I appreciate it, man. Thank you so much. So thanks again, everybody. This was geared up. Uh, it was super special to have Patrick on here. If you have any questions about any of the stuff that we talked about today, any of the things that uh, if you want to talk some more about the gear or you just have some other lighting questions, you can jump into one of our one-on-one -on -one breakout sessions. Uh, you can check those out on profoto.com. Uh, in the meantime, have an awesome rest of your week. Uh, and we'll see you next time on Geared Up. Peace out. Thank you.